Here are three amazing underwater hockey player tips for beginners that are worth at least $1,000 each, and I'm giving them away for free. Tip number one, you can't receive a pass on the surface. I know it sounds a bit trite, but the field of play in underwater hockey is on the bottom of the pool. There is nothing more frustrating for an experienced player than to battle the puck away from two or three snarling underwater ogres and then look to make the pass and see all of his or her teammates floating on the surface eating bonbons and sipping mint juleps. I guess I should clarify for those folks that are non-underwater hockey players thinking, wow, they really eat bonbons and sip mint juleps in the game? That, folks, is what we call a metaphor, or if you grew up in Kentucky with me, a metaphor. I was serious, though, about playing against ogres. Continuing. The Doc Lucky rule of positioning is if you are on the surface and you see your teammate curling, you are too late. You need to anticipate and be in position before your teammate needs to make that pass. Do I violate my rule? I do. And I might add exceptionally well. However, I feel really bad about it. So what do you do to combat the siren song of surface oxygen? My suggestion is think about it all the time and try to work into a drop rhythm incrementally. Practice after your first drop coming up and taking a couple of breaths and then drop whether you need to or not to get in the habit of getting back into the play and then add the third and fourth drops to it. And I don't know what happens after that because I'm subbing out. The other option is, and my preference, is to talk my way on the side with really good players because I do enjoy eating bonbons and sipping mint juleps on the surface. Tip number two, drop times are not generally long. I know in the lay press, it may say that underwater hockey players stay submerged sometimes for up to two or three minutes. That, of course, is totally bogus. Now, I will say it may feel like we're down for two or three minutes, especially if you're actively battling for the puck. However, my sons and I did a research paper exactly how long drop times are in underwater hockey. You may ask, why would we do that? Well, it's just what nerdy jocks do. Now, a drop time is the time from when you submerge to the time that you break the surface to breathe. We examined 2,000 drops in games that range from club level all the way to world championship level, and what we discovered was the average drop time for underwater hockey players is a whopping 11 seconds. Now, that's if you have no contact with the puck, and 12 seconds on average if you have contact with the puck. This surprised a lot of folks, including many aquatics directors who love to pray daily before the posted sign, no holding your breath in the pool. But even a chain-smoking, asthmatic, rotund aquatics director can be cajoled into holding his breath for 12 seconds with little ill effects. However, he might cough up a couple of greenish hawkers after doing it, so watch out. The study was published in Curious Magazine, uh, Curious Medical Journal, which is a peer-reviewed uh, science journal. I listed the link down in the uh, video description in case you need to convince an aquatics director that underwater hockey is not an extreme acnic sport. Now, this drop time, of course, is an average, but it was very rare to see anybody underwater for over 20 seconds in game play. And this makes sense if you think about it, because if you drop down and are vigorously active for much longer than that, the next thing you're doing is tiger breathing on the surface. This is tiger breathing. <laughs> and as with our first tip, if you're not on the bottom of the pool, you're not in the play. The problem for many beginners is they go down, they feel they need to stay down for an extremely long period of time until they completely exhaust themselves, and then they're out of the play for the rest of the point. So the underwater hockey mantra should be drop, destroy, surface, repeat, shoot for 12 seconds, and if you can't, sub out. My final tip, and the one I feel is the most important tip for beginners to understand is maintaining control of the puck is more important than advancing the puck. 
Now, my background is competitive swimming. So when I started playing, I loved the concept of the strike, racing for the puck at the start of each point. I would drive that puck deep into the enemy territory, sending ogres scrambling to the surface. I would then immediately lose the puck, use up all my O2s doing it, and be stuck on the surface as my teammates glared at me while giving me the mid-finger salute. Your side can't score a point if you don't control the puck. It requires less energy to maintain control of a puck on your side than to steal a puck from an opponent. Just, just think about it. Possession may be nine-tenths in law terms, but it is ten-tenths in underwater hockey. The team that retains the puck is almost invariably wins the game. If you can advance the puck without losing it, do so. However, it is better to get the puck to a teammate than advancing and losing the puck. I know the hot dog gene in every one of us wants to celebrate gaining ground over giving the puck to someone else. However, how useful in football is a running back that can average 20 yards a run but fumbles the ball at the end of the run every time? He's certainly not going to get a $20 million contract, that's for sure. Celebrate in your mind retention over advancement and you'll become a better, stronger player. If 12 years ago when I had started to play, I had understood these three concepts early, I would have been a much better player. And for my teammates, I promise I will start using these strategies for the first time next practice, except for hanging out on the surface, eating bonbons and drinking mint juleps. Some things you just can't stop. And don't forget to subscribe to uh, Orlando Underwater Hockey.